Okay, I've got 712 by my watch. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, uh, we are here tonight. The, the main order of business is um, our continued review of applications for uh, spring 2025 annual town meeting. Uh, we had a little scheduling snafu with Affordable Housing Trust Fund Committee. Um, so we will be tabling that for this evening and uh, we'll be scheduling our next meeting date uh, towards the end of this meeting. Uh, and we will be inviting affordable housing to that meeting. So first up tonight, uh, we have a, uh, a presentation for the Engine 25 Historic Preservation. Nate, are you in the Zoom? <laughs> you start whenever you're ready. Yep. So you should be able to share your screen. And you need to put your volume off the host can share your Okay, we're good, good to go. So first, welcome. Um, and uh, yeah, if you'd like to introduce yourself and, uh, and tell us a little bit about the project. Yep, uh, so I'm Na uh, Nathan Kendall. Uh, I grew up in town, I live at 26 Breakneck Hill Road. I'm a firefighter in the Sulphur Fire Department since 2010. I'm a third generation Sulphur Firefighter. My father and gr uh, grandfather also in the fire department. Um, I met with the CPC. Uh, Last year, I recognized a bunch of faces, uh, brought this project very, uh, at the very early stages last year. Um, we decided to table it till this year to try to gather information, um, do our research, get everything kind of in line to present for this year. Um, so I submitted the application. I got the response from the committee a couple weeks ago or a week ago uh, with a list of uh, questions. Um, so what I did was I created a presentation to kind of <clears throat> go over that application again, um, kind of hit the points that are, the, the important points of the application, uh, included the stu uh, some stuff to answer the questions that the committee had for me, um, and hopefully answer most of your questions and, or get some more questions at you. <laughs> so we'll start off with uh, Engine 25 refur uh, refurbishment. <clears throat> this is a picture of Engine 25. Uh, this was taken in the very early 70s. We believe it was 71 or 72. Um, it's actually in front of the former headquarters, which is now the uh, House of, uh, South, uh, Southboro House of Pizza. <clears throat> so we'll start off with what is it? What is Engine 25? Engine 25 is a 1968 Maxim F model open cab pump. It was commissioned by Chief Edward Brock back in 1967. It was delivered in 1968 in uh, August. Uh, it was manufactured in the wonderful state of Massachusetts in Middleborough by the Maxim Motor Division uh, of Seagrave uh, Corporation. It was a, it's a custom-made pumper. It was custom-made to the specs of then Chief uh, Edward, uh, Edward Brock. It served uh, in Salisbury from 1968 all the way to 1997. 
uh, when it was sold uh, privately for, uh, or was sold off privately to live its life in a, a collection. Uh, it switched hands a bunch of times after that, living in private collections, being shown and whatnot. Uh, until last year, uh, it popped up on Facebook for sale. Um, it was in poor condition, and uh, the association thought that um, we would try to save it, and we talked with the owner. We, the owner gave us the, the first right of refusal, which was kind of nice. Um, we pretty much we bought it for what the scrap value was, and with the intent of trying to get it restored back to running condition to preserve its history to the town. <coughs> So through the presentation, I've kind of put in some random pictures of the engine in action or the engine at shows and stuff and that whatnot. Um, this is engine 25. Um, from what I've gathered from former members, this was the first major fire that engine 25 uh, operated at. This is actually the mill fire where the MBTA uh, parking lot exists today. <clears throat> what makes engine 25 unique? Right off the bat, it's, it's a classic open, uh, classic open cab four design, which is still used today. It's that snub nose look, the driver sitting in front of the, the front tires. Um, that was back in the 60s when that design kind of came forward. Uh, they were still doing the open cab or what some people consider convertible. Uh, engine, tw <clears throat> uh, engine 25 is pretty unique as in it only served in the town of Southboro. Um, a lot of times, or most of the time, I would say 90 to 95% of the time, a uh, fire department or municipality will buy a piece of apparatus. It'll serve that town, serve that city for X amount of years, whatever that department says their service of life is. And a lot of times it goes off and lives somewhere else. It goes to rural areas that don't have funding for uh, brand new trucks. Um, it could become a reserve piece for a city. Um, or, unfortunately, it could be scrapped. A lot of times, back in the, uh, the early 1900s, a lot of these trucks were scrapped in order to actually fund other trucks. Uh, so this has the Engine 25 has the, is very unique as it never actually went to live at another department. It served at Southboro and then went into collections because it was a, a great example of the Maxim F model uh, body style. Um, another thing that makes it Engine 25 unique is the documentation. A lot of times in the, uh, when it comes to vehicle restorations and, and whatnot, um, what kind of justifies restoring a vehicle is the documented history of the vehicle. You know, do you know where it came from? Do you, you know, who owned it, whatnot? Um, we actually have all the original documentation for the engine when it was first purchased by the town. <clears throat> uh, another nice little historic uh, note for it is uh, it's been rumored to be the only F model Maxim to still exist that served uh, at the, che uh, the Great Chelsea Fire in 1973. Um, I don't know if anybody, if, if anybody knows about that fire. It burned pretty much a quarter of the, the city. Um, Southboro responded mutual aid with three trucks, and Engine 25 was one of those trucks. <clears throat> and another, another part of what makes, what makes these you know, trucks, what they are is the story. If you, you talk to a lot of the, the former members, the retirees, they tell you stories about anything you want to, anything you want to know. Uh, but almost all, every single one of them has a story about Engine 25, how great it was, the fires they went to in it, driving it with the open cab. There's, there's always a story with those guys, with this engine. <clears throat> this is a picture of the original proposal that was signed by Edward Brock. I actually brought it here tonight. It's signed and embossed, embossed back in uh, 1967. These are usually thrown out pretty quick after engines get delivered or sold off. This is the original, <clears throat> or this is the log book for the uh, the Southport Fire Department, Engine 25 was stationed at headquarters, and this is uh, September 14th, 1973, is when they went to mutual aid. And you can actually see down below that the, 
the log for the day after, maintaining the engine, lubing, lubing all the joints of the engine, washing it, washing all the equipment. <clears throat> this is another picture of engine 25. We're uh, operating at a fire. Uh, if I remember correctly, this is a, a barn fire on Chestnut Hill Road in the early 70s. <clears throat> so what are our goals with the whole project? <clears throat> it's pretty basic. The goal is to refurbish the engine uh, to uh, mechanically and cosmetic, cosmetically. We want, it to, we want the pump to run, we want it to be able to drive down the road safely and look like what the members remember it. We're not going for a, a showroom finish, we're not going for a brand new looking truck. We're going for, we're aiming for what the retired members, what the old members remember the truck as. <clears throat> now the other thing we want to do is we obviously want to make it safer. There's been uh, a lot of advances when it comes to uh, uh, braking technology, um, clutches. We want to make the truck truck a little bit safer to operate and and drive down the road. And overall, just to save the history of the engine, it's the <clears throat> it's the only one we uh, it's the only antique apparatus that still exists that only serves itself. So what we plan on using the engine for is, as everybody loves seeing fire trucks, parades, <clears throat> community events such as Memorial Day, Summer Nights, Heritage Day, uh, educational purposes. We have a lieutenant, she's in charge of uh, safe education days. And she'd be, she would be able to take the engine to those days, use the engine as a prop, students would be able to touch it, kind of you know, learn about the history of fire engines, the fire service, how we've been doing it in Salisbury. Fire department open houses. We're always we always have our doors uh, open. Anybody can come in, look at the engine, touch the engine. You want to sit in it. Uh, and one kind of somber use for it will be funerals. Um, a traditional line of duty death funeral for a firefighter is um, when the casket is carried on top of a truck. With all the advances in technology, the current trucks that we have now makes it impossible for that to happen. Um, refurbishing engine 25 gives us kind of that option to if you know we don't ever don't want to think about it but if we ever had to have a ceremony where we had a line of duty death we could actually have a traditional one <clears throat> or if uh, a past member's family requests to have the engine at a funeral as a flower car we would also have it available for Uh, there's another picture. Uh, I believe this was in the late 80s. This was at a fire apparatus parade uh, in Muster. Muster's, <clears throat> Muster's where uh, fire trucks go. They kind of show off their pumping capability, um, the, the members' speed of hooking up the trucks to hydrants and how fast they can get the water out. Um, and this is, they brought this truck to a lot of Muster's. And uh, believe it or not, one of the guys sitting on the back <laughs> is uh, now Captain Ken Franks. You probably uh, won't like me saying that, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ownership, storage, and uh, ownership, insurance, and stone uh, storage. I know this is, uh, I think this was like three questions you guys had. Uh, ownership is currently owned by the South Fiber Association. Um, it's not registered, uh, it's not insured, it's not on the road. Um, but if the project goes through and it does, we and it does become road ready, uh, the association will insure it. Uh, the estimates we've been getting back um, are anywhere between five hundred and two thousand dollars, and that's all based upon um, do we want to add collision to it? Liability is obviously a given, um, but if we wanted to add a little bit of collision, obviously the, the cost is going to go up. Uh, most departments that have antique fire apparatus just do liability. Um, and the couple departments that I did ask about their insurance policies, and they both of them said it's no more than 500. So it's relatively cheap to insure. Um, the, uh, the other part of the ownership, I know this was a question that the committee had. 
Um, the association does intend to work with town council and create some sort of legal agreement that uh, the ownership shall be transferred to the town in the unfortunate event that the association were to dissolve. And the association's not in this to gain any money. We're just in this to save the truck, to save the history. <clears throat> um, and we, we want it to stay in town that way. So if the associ association were ever to dissolve or, or come into a financial hardship where they can't actually take care of the truck anymore, we would want it to be turned over to the town. We, we want it to stay in town. We don't want it to go anywhere else. <clears throat> um, and storage, uh, we do have written consent from uh, Chief Matini uh, to allow the storage of Engine 25 um, at the station currently. He actually is in, in favor of this whole project. He would like it to be stored at the station to encourage members to go over there, learn how to drive it, get it out, and show it to, show it to the residents and actually start using it. And this is just a copy of the letter that uh, the chief had sent me to the association. I can send you. I can send the committee a copy of that. Uh, this is another picture of Engine 25 sitting in the middle of all the modern day trucks. Uh, this was, I believe, this was '96. This was the year before it came out of service. So you can see how the Modern day trucks around it are, you know, they got the, they got doors on them, they got seat belts, they got roofs now, but Engine 25 was, was still trucking at the fire department then. The guys still loved it and it was one of the most reliable trucks they had. Costs. <clears throat> I know this is a big one. Uh, in the application, I had mentioned cost ranges. Um, that was just to kind of show that we did the due diligence of uh, what it would cost to do this in stages versus right away, looking at other, looking at multiple vendors to try to get a good idea of how much it's gonna cost to do what we wanna do. Um, the end number that, we've, that we settled on was 300,000. Um, that is, that matches with one of the quotes that we got from a company called Sturgis uh, Hauling and Restoration. Uh, Sturgis is currently doing a project for Medway. Uh, they have a, a, a very similar project they're doing. Uh, they're doing a full restoration on one of their engines. Uh, it's just a few years older than ours, almost in the same condition as ours. Um, and they got funding, I want to say it was like five years ago, for $295,000 for their project. Um, so Sturgis thinks they can, they can do ours for almost similar, which is pretty good considering how the economy has been the past five years. <clears throat> and this was, that was uh, this quote, I attached this quote to the application, but this was a quote from Sturgis. It's a very great quote, quote. I know it's not very detailed, because uh, he just, he does things one way, and it's a, it's a process, you just kind of give it to him, say, we want it done. He rips the truck apart, puts it back together the way you want it, and then gives it back to you. <clears throat> he goes through every nut and bolt of these trucks. This is, uh, this is an example of one of the trucks he did. Uh, a while back of uh, you know the condition of some of these trucks that come in versus what he's putting back out <clears throat> which brings us to the actual process and I think this is going to touch on the question the committee had about the detail asking about more detail like what it's what, what the whole thing is so <clears throat> the process of what's going to happen is it's a frame off refurbishment which means um, Sergio is going to take the vehicle and they're going to literally take it apart piece by piece. Every bolt comes off, every light comes off, every piece of wire comes out. He takes the entire thing apart, goes through it piece by piece. He rebuilds the axles as needed. <clears throat> he's not going to put a new one in, he's just going to take it apart. If it needs a bearing, he's going to put a bearing in, then he's going to put it all back together. Same thing with the pump, he's going to take it apart, replace what needs to be replaced, put it back together. Transmission, same thing. Body, <clears throat> body rust and uh, dent repair. Uh, where it starts getting to the refurbishment part is with the engine. <clears throat> uh, through the research we did over the last year, um, we found that if we kept the original gasoline engine, which is a, uh, a straight six uh, gasoline engine, Wukasha, it is a complicated engine. It has a complicated ignition system. Uh, relies on carburetors, which is all 
old school stuff, which I'm sure the guys back in the 70s could handle, but we just don't use that stuff and a lot of that, that's a lost art, adjusting distributors and carburetors throughout the year for temperature and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> and the other problem we have with the gasoline engine is it was made when leaded gas was still around. We have unleaded gas now, so that would mean that engine would have to be completely disassembled, gone through by an engine rebuilder, and modified to accept unleaded gasoline. Or we could go down the route of putting a period correct diesel engine in. So we would just remove the gasoline engine, find a, uh, find a period correct diesel engine around the same time, and we put that in. It runs on the same <clears throat> diesel fuel, is the same as it was back in the 70s, it hasn't changed. It doesn't have carburetors, it works on injection. It <clears throat> um, doesn't have ignition systems like a gasoline does. It's much more simple, and it's simple for the people operating it too. Instead of getting up, instead of uh, members getting out there and having to tune a, tune a carburetor or ignition to try to get going, they can just turn a key. Um, and the best part is, it's cheaper. The rebuilding a gasoline engine, modifying it for today's fuels, could run up to $100,000. Finding a used diesel engine, just putting it in, not having to do too much work to it, could run half that, if, if not less. Um, that's the route that Medway's actually taken with their truck. They had the same engine we did, and they chose to get rid of it due to the, the complicatedness of the engine and the cheaper op uh, option of putting a diesel engine in. Uh, the, another thing we, were, we wanted to do is upgrade the brakes. Uh, originally came with a hydraulic brakes and then was updated two years after delivery to a dual air brake system, which is obsolete now. Um, we were going to leave that up to Sturgis to try to figure out what would be the best option for us to put in a brand new hydraulic system or try to get a, an, an air brake system in there. Uh, wheel upgrade. The, the truck came with front wheels that are called split wheels. They're very dangerous. Most tire shops don't even touch them anymore because they're a huge liability. Um, so we want to take those off and put a more modern day steel wheel on that isn't going to be dangerous for people to swap tires on. Um, electrical, go through the entire truck, redo the electrical that needs to be done, uh, try to find the original lights that were, came on from the factory, <clears throat> and obviously some paint, chrome, and gold leaf to get it back to the original spec of what it was back in the uh, 70s. So these are pictures. I got permission from Medway. This is their truck that they're having that they're currently having done now. The left is obviously the before picture. It was fairly rough shape, pretty I would say arguably a little worse than what we got. Um, first thing they do is they take they take the truck completely apart. <clears throat> There's the frame. They've already gone through the frame. All the leaf springs have been gone through. They sandblast it. They put uh, rust inhibitor paint on it so we don't have to worry about any corrosion from the future. Uh, they go through the brakes. They go through the axles. You can see that the, the pump has already been gone through. Uh, and then on the right is the body of the truck is getting new panels. Uh, unfortunately for them, their, uh, their body was a little bit too far gone where they actually have to re rebuild the vast majority of the body, um, but this, this shop called Sturgis is more than capable of performing um, what's needed to get it rebuilt back to the original specs. Alternative funding, uh, we've, <clears throat> we've started uh, looking at this and um, if any of you attended the open house that we had on Heritage Day, we had kind of like a show and tell of the truck. We ha uh, had a lot of documents out, pictures, pictures of the truck, um, explaining the, the history of it to the people, uh, to the, the residents. Um, and we also, the association has opened up a Venmo and an, an account for donations. So if citizens want to donate towards the, the refurbishment of the truck, they're more than welcome. We have a way to, for them to do that. Um, and the other, um, the other fund, it's not really a funding alternative, it's more of um, cost reducing, is we're looking for donor vehicles. Um, it's one thing that happens with the um, antique tr cars is instead of trying to rebuild the body like Medway has to do, 
we're trying to uh, we're trying to find a truck that's like engine 25 where they can source parts from instead of making stuff brand new they can take them clean them up and then put them back in if if what we have is beyond repair at least we have something that's very correct is did come from the factory and we can put it in the truck but it's not it's not brand new <clears throat> um, and that's also with the uh, the engine is we're trying to find a Maxim truck with a diesel engine to try to keep it you know as period correct as we can. The completion of the projects, the association has set a deadline for, uh, for completion uh, to be before the tricentennial celebration. We think is there is more than enough time for Sturgis to complete the project, and honestly, there's probably no better date to unveil it than the tricentennial celebration. Couple more pictures, some old, uh, old members of the fire department. I think, no, it's not my dad. <laughs> Did you put any pictures of I could, I, this time, I, I don't want to embarrass him too much. <laughs> so in closing, uh, the association is committed to seeing the engine saved. Uh, we're trying to do whatever we can on our end to, to help achieve that with funding and whatnot, trying to find donor vehicles, doing the research, um, it's the it's the truck's history, it's the truck's the documentation that makes it worthy of this project, worthy of saving. Um, it, the truck deserves another chapter in its life. It's it's still here for a reason. hasn't been scrapped yet. It's never been used anywhere else. I, I think it I think it deserves to be brought back to life and continue to live here in Southboro. Um, and we're just we hope that without CPA funding, um, that this is Engine 25 won't be able to be saved and put back on the road the way the members remember. Well, that's all I got. If anybody's got some new questions. Thank you very much. Huh? Um, yeah, so, uh, my second question is in general. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you very much, Nate, for the, the presentation. Actually, the history of it is fascinating. It's really cool. Um, a couple of the questions that we that we asked, uh, um, we certainly have gotten some answers to, and that's great. You know, we had gotten some information that insurance could potentially be very expensive, and I think um, that may have been a discussion more of uh, at putting collision insurance on it, um, which, and that makes sense. And uh, I guess we are unsure what the proposed ownership situation would be. It seemed through perusing the application that it might be, uh, you know, the intention to restore it and then immediately turn it over to the town. Um, and, and, it, and that was a misunderstanding. Um, and what you're proposing is that the association will maintain ownership of the truck and, and be responsible for its maintenance and upkeep. And, uh, uh, and then the storage question is, um, you've got a great place uh, to store it. And uh, so um, uh, thank you. And those were the, those were the big uh, questions. Um, there's one thing that I think we may run past the Community Preservation Coalition just to make sure. Uh, the engine swap, this comes up in historical preservation projects. The, the Community Preservation Act, and in particular the Massachusetts Department of Revenue's guidance on the, on the issue, is the things that you would expect would be preservation. They, in some cases, they don't consider preservation. Um, so that we would just want to get some guidance on 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 the engine on the engine swap. Would that qualify as preservation? How should that be addressed? Um, it sounds like uh, with some of the fundraising you're doing, perhaps you know that would have to be steered towards that component of the project, um, something like that. I think in a worst case scenario. But uh, again, something we will will reach out to the the Community Preservation Coalition and get some expert advice on it and make sure we've got that particular I dotted. Yep. Okay, so that's what I've got. Let's go down the line. All right. Nate, thank you. That was a really great presentation. I really enjoyed seeing the pictures. That was uh, pretty awesome to see the history of the town. I do have a few questions, though. Um, Medway, were, did they use CPC funds to restore their project? They did. Okay. Do you know... Um, and again, this is probably a tough question, but off the top of your head, is it, is it fairly standard for towns to, you know, uh, 
again, seeing as Southboro, I think we're, we're kind of unique, like you said, because it was only used in Southboro. Um, do a lot of towns that you're aware of uh, go through the process of restoring a, um, a, a truck, a, a ladder, a whatever, a pumper? So it's, when we looked into that one, I mean, it's, there's always been antique trucks sitting yeah. around. A lot of departments haven't, they've been, you know, uh, they kept them. Uh, but we've seen an increase in the past few years of departments finding old their old apparatus, their old trucks, and then getting them back. Um, again, Medway, Medway did it, Ashland has done it, Ashland has two of their, old, uh, their original uh, Mack trucks. Um, one went through a partial uh, restoration, they have another one currently going through a complete restoration at the same company, Sturgis. Um, Foxborough, I believe, has three antique trucks. Okay. Um, this is becoming a, an up-and-coming thing with fire departments, is they're trying to hold on to their, their history. Yep. Um, and uh, these, the, tr the value, of the, the, not the value of the trucks, but the, the sought-afterness sought of it. The, um, trucks nowadays just aren't, nobody's going to collect them. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're just, they're trucks, they're full of electronics, they're full of safety stuff. And they just, they're, these are, this truck was like built in the, the heyday of yep. firefighting. It's arguably the... The, the last great generation of fire trucks. There was no seatbelts, there was no roof on yep. it. There was, the guys would hang off the side or in the back, you know, going to the fire. It was just after that in the late 70s is when NFPA came in and was put a kibosh on that. Yep. No more, going to put roofs on, you need doors, all that stuff. And why I ask is, because I think as this moves forward through the process, I mean, I think these are important points for the citizens of Southboro to know that, you know, we're not trying to reinvent a wheel that, you know, other towns are, you know, really trying to restore the history. And, and, and again, this truck has a pretty amazing history with the Chelsea fire and whatnot. Um, so thank you for that. And um, let's see, Ben, you already addressed the maintenance um, and the restriction as far as the standards of restoring. Um, you're going to ask that question, and could you take just one minute for somebody that may be watching this, which I think is great that we're actually, you know, having it um, on the video like this. Can you just take two seconds and tell us, and anyone listening, what is the association and what it does? So the Southboro, uh, Southboro Firefighters Association is uh, comprised of uh, full-time call members <coughs> and retirees. Um, it's been around since the 70s. What we do is we, uh, it, it, oh, it's kind of, it's hard to explain. <laughs> um, I mean, it's kind of like a, fr I look at it like a friends, like we have friends of the recreation and, yeah, it was originally you know. Created to kind of like, you know, to, to help the community. You know, we okay. hand out, uh, we hand out a, a, a scholarships to college. Okay. Every year. Um, we, we always donate to sports teams, anybody who sends us a letter looking for donations, we donate. So you're very involved in the community, yeah, which was kind of the, the yeah. point I was hoping that you would say. That, and it's, uh, um, and it's, it's nice because it's comprised of everybody that works at the fire department who's ever, ever worked there. So we, you'll get guys that have been worked, that retired back in the 70s. They still show up to meetings. Um, so it's just kind of like a, it's sort of like an extension of the brotherhood, but we're always there to help somebody else. Got it. Okay, Nate, thank you again. This, this was a great presentation. I really enjoyed learning more about it, and uh, I look forward to going through the process. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. I'm looking through the questions that we'd sent before, and you really answered, I think, everything that we had put down. It was great to see more of the pictures, hear more of the history, um, and also understand how other towns are doing this, to see the process in Medway, to understand their quote and how that informs the quote we got. Um, I think my one question was on the timeline. Um, typically, how long does it take Sturgis to complete this this type of work? It's, uh, it ranges. It all depends on availability, uh, availability of parts, the condition of the truck when they finally get it apart, um, if things can be saved. Yep. Um, I know Medway's project was pushed out another six months because they just the body of the truck was just in such a bad condition, it was better off for them just to just rebuild it. Um, so that was a big delay. Um, sometimes it, things just go smooth. You just, 
the, it, I believe Sturgis said it was to pretty much allocate a year hmm. for getting it going through everything because he, he's doing multiple projects all at once too. Um, so it's, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a year. I'd say I'm, I'd probably say a little bit more than a year, seeing what's happening with Medway's process. Uh, that's about yeah. it. Thank you. No, that's helpful to know. And with the the goal of the tricentennial and the Springtown meeting, all of that lines up. So, thank you. That's it. Uh, thanks, Nate, for your presentation, and also thanks for the tour. I think it was last year, right? I, last year. Okay. I, time flies, but um, that was really useful uh, as well to get a, a sense of it and. Also to know that you were planning on this, uh, putting this application forward. Um, uh, so as you know, I'm the historical representative. So we have two requirements uh, here. One is that we have to make a determination, or historical, sorry, has to make a determination that the um, whatever you're restoring or preserving, rather, is relevant to the history of the town. And I think it's clearly, you know, you made, you made that case very well that, you know, it's only served in Southboro, uh, and I don't think there's any question about that. Um, I do have a concern, or I guess maybe a question about the swapping of the engine that, to be honest with you, this is the first application of this kind in which, um, you know, it's not a, uh, a house or something in which you're preserving the exterior or a document, but, you know, there's a different pieces here. So, you know, if you're replacing a, a part of the truck or upgrading it or something, whether or not that counts as preservation and is fundable, I don't know, but um, so I do have that question, and maybe that could result in, um, you know, you finding a, a funding offset somewhere, and we, we'd only be able to fund the, you know, the parts. Gotcha. Um, it seems very strict the requirements that, based on my experience, but yeah. you know, maybe there's an argument to be made that you know those tires are unsafe and they have to be upgraded or something, and that I don't know, but um, uh, let's see. Uh, and yet, yeah, the main concern that I, uh, or question I guess that I still have is about the ownership. Um, oftentimes with historical assets, especially with private um, groups, uh, I think it's been the CPC's policy and practice to make sure that like our, the town's investment is kind of secured. Um, uh, and so with a historic building, that often means a preservation restriction so that, you know, the town puts all this money into the building and then, you know, the owner can't just take the money and sell it and, you know, make a quick buck on it or something. Yep. Um, so uh, I do have, I guess, a concern that um, because you are a private organization that it, essentially how would we make sure that um, uh, both that there's like public access to the truck um, I know that you're planning on doing that, but I don't know if, we, if that would be a way to ensure that the public can actually um, see it at certain times or something like that, uh, as well as um, just ownership. Um, you said kind of if the association dissolves, but, um, you know, what happens if, you know, the association just doesn't want to, I'm not saying this is, but down the road 30 years from now or something, the association just doesn't want the public to see the truck anymore or something, then, you know, that could kind of be like three three hundred thousand dollars wasted, essentially, in terms of public mm -hmm. public funds. So, um, some sort of guarantee would be something that I, I'm looking for or interested in. Uh, but other than that, I, I think it's um, a really interesting application, and I'm uh, happy you brought it forward. Just Thanks. Gonna jump in real quickly. So yep. we have sort of a precedent for this with the Buck family flag, where uh, the historical society actually signed an affidavit um, uh, that that addressed these concerns to protect you know, the town's interest in the artifact. And I think, did you say that you're speaking with town council? So we, we haven't done it yet, but, but you're going to, yeah. to speak with town council okay. to form some sort of legal agreement where it's... Great. It's, it goes straight to the town if anything happens. Yeah, so our, our town council, Jay Tallerman, uh, seems to have, have a, a very firm grasp on Community Preservation Act and all of its, all of its interesting requirements. And I think uh, uh, he could help craft a document that would satisfy CPA and give us the confidence that we're protecting the, the town's interest. Um, and then Grant, you know, I, sh I shared the, you know, uh, you know, the question about the, the engine, the engine swap, but Freddie, you said you've... Well, no, I, I will ask more about it, but it's, it's somewhat similar. Sorry. It's somewhat similar to thinking about uh, home preservation. 
if it didn't have a furnace, you and you're restoring it to make it use, you know, you might you would be able to put a furnace in. So I will double check because what the restoration requirements are for a vehicle, if there's standards, and um, I have a call in later with uh, Stuart, so I'll add that to the list. Um, there may be certain things about a vehicle that we hadn't even thought of because we haven't done one before, but um, especially if you're, what, what uh, Ben said, if you're fundraising other, other ways of getting funding in, that you can, if it's not quite an allowable use, that it could go, you know, you, the private funds go towards that component. So. And, and what I can do too prior to the next meeting is I'll pull all the information I can find about Medway and the requirements that they did and you know that might be helpful to us as well as, as we move forward and again as Freddie said I think there's things that we hadn't probably thought about that you know may come up so that might be useful as well but I'll, I'll pull some of that stuff and get it to Ben and he can distribute it before the next meeting Thank or you. the next time we discuss it. Thank you Lisa. I'm sorry Doug didn't mean to uh, get, uh, no, it's fine. Uh, so, again, thank you for the presentation as well. I uh, appreciate the detail and the history. I think you guys have really asked all of my comments or concerns. Um, from a, a third-party perspective, I'm not necessarily concerned about the engine being changed out, per se. It is about just funding applicability type of thing, but it, it's like inside a house. It's, if you don't see it, it's not, it's not the historic part of it. Um, so um, I had more of a more logistical question, more for the board. How much CPA funds are available in fiscal year 25? So we don't have the number yet. Okay. We are eagerly awaiting it. Um, it's next meeting. yeah. We, so we anticipate having it by the next meeting. Um, it seems like it, it should be such a cut and dry thing, uh, and it's not. And it has to do with uh, uh, the number of bonds that are out and and uh, the way that they have been issued and some recently issued bonds. Trying to figure out exactly what we're going to have available is, is a complicated process, and uh, town accountant has been working diligently on it. We're getting it next meeting. Okay. And no, any sense of range or no? It's it's still too wild. I'm just curious. The, the range would be pretty large. I'd, yep. I'd say I would feel comfortable saying between three and five hundred thousand dollars. But, but yep. again, um, I may not even catch it in that range. Um, okay. So we will, you know, we'll be finding out soon, though. Yeah. I mean, my only other comment is obviously a significant amount, you know, of money. Um, Definitely be curious as you guys do fundraising, maybe there's some match or something else. I just thinking about town meeting and going to it, you know, um, and seeing what else has been approved in the past. It just seems it's a, it's a, it's a big amount of money. So that would be the only thing I would, you know, at least, you know, preface or put out there, you know. Um, but it's definitely a unique engine, uh, definitely really unique to find something that's only served in South Borough uh, and have that kind of history. So um, that definitely is unique and different. So, uh, but yeah, but thank you. Really appreciate the presentation. Uh, I just want to touch on one thing, uh, public access. Uh, part of the, the chief's thinking with keeping it at the station is fire station's open 24-7. You want to come over and see it, go sit in the front seat, have at it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll always be available to the public. It's, it's, we'll treat it just like any other truck. Yeah. You want to come visit, we're open. You guys do that now. Fantastic. Yeah. Can I? Fantastic. Chad, please, Freddie. Jump in. Um, I was going to make a suggestion that maybe the committee think about things they and I will ask Stuart as well from the coalition that would be in any legal affidavit and get back in that before you go to the town council, get the input from the committee on what they would want to see in it. So you don't have a, you don't go down a path that doesn't include everything that a discussion might um, benefit. Great point. And uh, before I forget, um, so do we have anyone from the public joining us in the Zoom queue? Okay, uh, if there's anyone from the public here this evening who wishes to ask a question or make a comment on this project, please use the raise hand function and we'll promote you right up so you can do that. Yeah. Okay, no hands. Uh, anybody joining us here tonight in person who'd like to ask a question, make a comment? Okay. Well, Nate, thank you very much for coming in this evening. So uh, you've, you've, you answered all the questions that, uh, um, that we had asked, which is fantastic. Um, we're gonna, you know, like we said, we're gonna touch base with the Community Preservation Coalition just to, um, uh, to get an answer on the, the engine swap um, issue. And, um, uh, and then, you know, you know with the, uh, we'll be finding out 
uh, for our next meeting what funding will be available this year. Um, um, you know, a lot's going to depend on that. Um, we we've, we've have a total of uh, uh, six applications this year, and uh, the, the committee has, it seemed like it was going to happen last year and didn't quite, but I think for the very first time we're going to be in a position where uh, there will be more um, funding requests than there are funds available to, uh, to fund them. Um, so if that does happen, um, you know, we'll have to, that'll be a discussion we'll have to have, but obviously it'll be in a public meeting and, um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take it from there. So we, yeah, we're, we're eagerly awaiting, uh, um, our report from town, town accountant. All right. Thank you. Nate, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Okay. So next up. Uh, we have the Town Common Railing and Fence Post Historic Preservation. Oh, a great application, obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. Probably one of the better ones, yeah. yeah. Welcome, Andrew and Kevin. Thanks for joining Thanks. us tonight. Thanks, CPC. <laughs> Do you have a presentation or anything you need to do? You need to... No. Okay. okay. Yeah, so we spoke briefly by phone the other day, and I, I pointed out to Andrew that this is uh, uh, the application itself, I think, is the most uh, complete, thoughtfully prepared uh, CPC application that I've seen in the, the 10 years that I've been doing this. Uh, so thank you very much um, for, for putting the work into that. Well, really, um, I have to thank Bill, Bill Cundiff because yeah. the real substance of it was the memo that he put together. Yeah. All the work that he has done, all the supporting pictures. So it's something that we've been working on for a long time, thinking about um, things, kind of a long list of things that need to be fixed around town. I know this is something Kevin and I had talked about beginning two years ago, even yeah. longer than that. Uh, Andrew, I think your microphone may be off. There we, there we go. Yeah. Also, I'm bringing um, Bill over just so, as a panelist, just so you know. Sure. So. Um, the credit to the completeness of the application goes to Bill yep. because he put together the very substantive memo that explains the different options. Yes. And it's something we've been talking about doing for a long time. I know Kevin and I have talked about this for a while. And um, you know, I like at the, on the select board, they kind of each year doing a goal setting in our meeting yep. where we just have a list of longer term, short term, medium term. So this was on a list of <coughs> just shorter term. It's not that difficult to put together this application, get it done by August 31st, try to get this on the warrant for the uh, annual town meeting in 2025. Yes. So I can give a little history of talk, talk more about it or speak to some of the questions that you have in the letter that I got. Um. I'm trying to think back. I, the uh, or if you just have questions, and yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, uh, Andrew gave me a call the other day, and uh, um, uh, was asking. I think it was primarily about the, um, um, the 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 one comment that the application needs to be on the official form, and uh, I told him that at the end of the process, at the end of the process, um, uh, that will need to take place. Um, as folks may recall, um, uh, Freddie, Lisa, and I met with town council about six weeks ago now. Uh, and it, this was relative to the whole issue of, of the memoranda of understanding versus grant agreements and, and all that. Um, and his recommended path forward for, uh, for town projects uh, because we can't enter into a contract with the town. We can't do the memorandum of understanding. We can't do the uh, uh, grant agreement. What he recommended is throughout the process, get the application updated to contain, you know, everything covered during the application process, and then simply reference that application in the warrant article that gets submitted to town meeting. So for that reason, by the end of this process, and certainly covering any discussions that we have tonight, um, uh, uh, there is a, a Word document format uh, file with the application in it that's very easy to fill out. 
Um, I think there was some confusion this year with there was a PDF that couldn't be edited and, and yep. yeah. So uh, uh, we can make sure that you have access to that Word document and just by the end of the application process, we'll just need a, a current okay. version of it. <clears throat> um, and just wanna make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, there were of the three estimates. You know, of course, there's there's a a, a, a big difference between um, uh, the historically accurate historical preservation and the simply getting it back looking neat. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, along with that, you know. Um, if there were other funds available, the project could probably be done less expensively. And, and for the, many of the reasons, you know, when we were talking with, with Nate previously, you know, with CPA funds, the, the, the standards for historical preservation are fairly strict. Um, so we ask every applicant if there are other uh, uh, funding alternatives that have been um, um, considered, you know, in whole or in part for the project. Um, Okay, so um, I, I asked, I think I asked you, um, the, the, I haven't done a deep dive research right. into grant eligibility for this, but I mean, I've asked around, I've asked Bill, I've asked Kevin, and are you aware of any grants that might cover this? And no, no one has been able to identify something sure. right away. You know, another trade off is, um, I mean, the, time frame to get this done is kind of the, pretty much the same one that Nate was talking about. Right. It's nice to get this done by the tricentennial. Oh, absolutely. The list. It's actually in pretty bad condition right now, so it does yep. need to be fixed. Yep. So the reason why we as a board thought this was the best way to go is, you know, I've always thought a project like this is one of the, like, the heartland things of, of the CPA, right? Yep. And it's something that we could get done um, with town meeting approval, you know, in the spring. I, the different grant processes, I mean, I'm familiar right, like with the one-stop application where we haven't been as successful in you know, getting grants approved as we would like. It's a more complicated process than you might think and there's increasingly a lot of competition for that. So that's what I can say about that. I know there's a question about ARPA. We never really seriously okay. you know, considered that. We actually had a meeting last night. We made the final votes to allocate all of the ARPA funds so that they're contractually committed by end of this year, which is required yep. under the, the rules. So, um, I mean, it's something we could do just with an ordinary town meeting warrant article. And if we were to do the quote one, uh, it's less than $4,000, we wouldn't be bothering you or anything like that. Yeah, there's an intermediate one that was so in the, I think, yeah. Kevin, sorry to put you on the spot, when I, you know, we've talked about the opinions of which, what would you like to do, right? In terms of the cost difference, uh, my recollection is you felt pretty strongly about didn't like the post and chain. It's something that's kind of different. The true more um, maintaining the existing materials and look of the granite post and rail system would be the option three, where from what I understand from Bill, to do that, you should uh, engage our engineer to create some bid documents and then yep. bid it out. Is that right, Bill? That is correct. Um, anytime you get this level of magnitude with a project, the scope becomes very important, particularly if you're restoring uh, historic features. You want to make sure that they're done properly and you're achieving the desired effect. So. To that end, I think it's it's important and valuable to have a set of bid documents prepared so that competing contractors can bid on a finite scope and everybody knows what they're bidding on. Yeah, and our best rough estimate of the spend, inclusive of the engineering fee, is 110. So that's the number. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, like I said, we you know we we ask every applicant if the, you know what other funding sources have been considered, and it, it you know sounds like some thought has has, has been has been given to that. Um, ben, do you mind if I add to that? Yeah, please. Um, so 
One, I, I think you're probably aware of it, that I've looked into is the Mass Preservation Projects Fund, which is at the, the State Mass Historical Commission. Uh, I mistakenly thought that that was only for historic buildings, but it's actually for also for historic resources, landscapes, other things like that. So I was just taking a look, and I don't know, I don't know exactly how the grant program works, but the application for that is in March. Uh, um, well, so we're talking about next year's town meeting, so this is this year's dates, but March 15th. And then the award, whoever they choose, is awarded by June. Um, I know it's a reimbursable grant, so I think you have to have the funds available, and I don't know how that works with town meeting scheduling and stuff like that, but um, we can condition. just wanted to let... Again, grant? Sorry? Uh, what's the name of the grant program? Oh, Mass Preservation Projects Fund. Um, and it's only for municipalities and um, nonprofits are eligible for those. Um, so again, I don't know. I don't know exactly how the reimbursable part works, and um, with funds available, and how the, how exactly all of that works. But that is one that um, I guess that would probably be you do it. It's a reimbursement mechanism rather than a. That's a 50% state-funded reimbursable matching grant program. Yeah. Um, right, and I I would just throw in that. Um, for instance, that was the mechanism that um, Salem restored a fence around their common. Yeah. A, a quite a bit more elaborate than what we have. Yes. Um, similar to what you would see around the public garden in Boston or in the common. Yeah. Um, and that was done in a combination of CPA funds and from Mass Historical, the mm -hmm. Preservation Projects Fund. It's a difficult mechanism. Um, and the timing did not align, um, and it, it, you know, I was aware of that, but it struck me that it was probably not um, viable for, but, you know, it's, it just throws the timing off quite oh. considerably. Can, can I jump in? I yeah. think there may, there may be a way to address this that, yeah. that I think would be am amenable to everybody. Um, we can, and we've done this in the past, in fact, we did it with uh, uh, using different funding mechanisms, but with the Trails Committee and the Burroughs Loop Trail, what we could do assuming the, the committee, you know, votes in favor and, and puts an article together, is condition that article uh, uh, to allow for if, if for the article gets approved at, at spring annual town meeting, the funds don't become available until July 1st. Uh, we could condition the article such that uh, uh, any funds awarded by, a, for instance, an MPPF grant... Um, will will um, be you know will offset you know what I mean right but yeah. but that I don't think that would harm the schedule at all I think if we conditioned it that way and it would allow the flexibility for applying for the grant now just one thinking this through um, so is this a public grant program or a private grant program it's public it's the mass historical commission okay yeah. Yep. So, which is do you under the secretary. There'd state. be a chicken and egg problem where if we applied to them. They'd say, "Well, have you considered CPA money?" Or uh, we have funded projects that they have previously already issued a grant for, including right next door, the St. Mark's Bell Tower had received a fifty thousand dollars MPPF grant, and we subsequently, the following year, uh, um, successfully passed uh, a, a CPA appropriation. Yes, please. CPA legislation specifically addressed this where many state grants don't allow you to match with other state-funded monies, and CPA um, specifically is exempt from that requirement. So because CPA has state contributions for the state match, it is still fully allowable to match this grant. So... I mean, what we'd like to do is... Get approved for the whole 110, and then we would pursue the 50. And then if we yep. we get the 50, then we only spend 60. And so I think too, Andrew, that's that's a great sell for town meeting. You know that you have applied for this, and you're not looking to potentially tie up, you know, more CPC funds than you need to. And if the grant come back, comes back no, town meeting has, you know, I think it's going to be very amenable to this. And just want to clarify, that's what I was thinking in terms of I didn't I wasn't re requesting that you revise it down, but just that. Um, something to look into. That's all. Okay. Uh, Bill's, he's yeah. behind you. I can see from yes. his expression. Oh. Yes. Uh, 
the thing I'm reading now, I have the luxury of being on my computer while I'm here, um, says that the MPPF requires that properties eligible for the grant must be listed in the state his register of historic places. I'm not sure whether or not the town common qualifies for that, but I mean, certainly worth exploring. Uh, the, the town common is, um, does have a, a, a MACRIS listing um, and the fence is a contributing component. So um, I suspect it would um, qualify on that basis if that helps. Great. Yeah, and Andrew, so what we're, what we're talking about is, is uh, an article for the appropriation of the entire $110,000 uh, uh, with a condition in there that uh, that amount will be reduced by the amount of any grant subsequently awarded. That makes sense to me. Okay. I will double check on the best language for that. Yep. And I believe you have a historic district in the downtown area yes national yeah, yeah the that common is, area is part of the national Red that is the requirement right. being on macris doesn't do it because right. that's why we couldn't get funding for the townhouse or for the library but as soon as you got the historic district you would have qualified if that had been in place when we um when the cpc right, which, which encompasses the townhouse ironically. right yeah. but that common is in the district that gives it the qualification for being, um, you know, eligible for the grant, which is a wonderful thing. The historical commission yeah. got done. Okay, so uh, just like to go down the line for questions, comments, concerns. Well, thank you, Grant. You took care of my one question that I had. <laughs> um, I would just like to say that that Bill, Andrew, and Kevin, I think this is a great project. Um, I think with you know what's coming up in the future with the Dry Centennial and everything, um, I think this really isn't in line. So um, I don't have any questions for you other than to say thank you for bringing it forward. Thanks for your support. Great, thank you. Um, I think the one question we had um, that we haven't talked about yet was the um, ongoing maintenance that I know we've had yeah, concerns in the past. Too. I mean, other than just painting the fence, Think of any. Okay. I mean, if, if something fell loose or came off, you'd think that this is a fix that could be done. It's just part of ordinary maintenance that could be done in house by the DPW. Okay. And there's nothing that needs to. It's not like a machine or yeah. anything like that with a service plan or <laughs> um, a roof or something like that. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just want to say a great application as well. Um, I'm in support. Uh, one, just wanted to clarify, in terms of the three options, I, th I think it was probably in the letter, but we think that the second option, which is like a recreation one, wouldn't qualify, and okay. I would be in favor of the like the full restoration 100%. Yeah, and, and just for clarification, because I think there was some confusion there for a second, that historicals vote, which is, of course um, was unanimous, was support of the full restoration of existing um, meaning the granite posts and the iron rail because yep. that's a historically accurate. And I would say, by the way, and it goes to the maintenance issue, is that we're not 100% sure when, the, there's a very interesting history with regard to this fence and um, when the, um, the soldier's monument, that's the Civil War obelisk that's right out front here, was put up in 1867, that area was I'm given a wooden fence, and at one point it, it prompted a dispute that carried somewhere into the 1880s with Pilgrim Church about the Pilgrim Church claimed that the fence was on their land, and somebody took it down at one point, and then the town came back after the mid-1880s and put the fence that we see today, um, and the, the retaining wall was built in that back in the 1860s in the steps, and then but somewhere you would say um, after mid 1880s, 1890s was when this fence was put up. So it's 130, you know, something odd years old. Um, and a proper restoration, I would hope, would give it another century of, you know, minimal maintenance, um, painting once in a while, but it should hold up. I have no idea how it came into its current condition. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. No one did anything for a long time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but yeah, so I would be in favor of the. the most expensive, you know, the full restoration. Um, but yeah, thanks again for the application and um, I hope it passes. 
Yeah, so I think, honestly, I think it's awesome. I think it's a great idea. Um, again, I was, appreciate the clerk. I was going to ask which one you guys are really focused on. And the third, I mean, to me, is unique. The second one is you can see that in many towns today. Um, and it's very unique. Um, I'll be curious to see what height you guys decide to go with because it runs from one foot off the ground to like three and a half feet off the ground. But um, <laughs> um, so, but I think it's a great idea. I think it'd be great to get it done before the tricentennial. Um, and it's just, it's also, it's very unique to Southboro. So, um, so I'd love to keep that and replicate that. So, but and thank you. So just a point of information that, um, let's say two years ago mm. when um, the select board met and thought about little projects like this. And we first thought about this project kind of bigger about including also improvements to, Kevin has pointed out particularly some parts of the old burial ground that there's similar kind of rails and posts in there that are falling apart. But um, that's a little more complicated, and I know that we're looking for at some other funding sources for, for that, including um, cemetery trust funds and, and things like that. So haven't forgotten about that. Um, but just this seemed like a pretty easy, straightforward application, so that's why we wanted to do this one first. But have not forgotten about that one. Okay. Uh, so it it sounds like and anyone oh wait I'm getting ahead of myself here uh, if anyone has joined us from the public this evening on zoom and would like to ask a question to make a comment please use the raise hand function and we'll promote you up so you can do that now, I did want to ask you about yes the question in the form about a preservation restriction yes I mean this is a pretty small thing right and it's on oh. town land and we do anticipate it lasting for hundred years so is it really required I mean I was thinking that on a, a, a parallel is the work that was done in this building but that is much much I, I don't know that we could get a preservation restriction yeah. on okay. on uh, a landscaping feature <laughs> rel you know um, however pardon um, one, one thing we can do is um, capture that commitment within the application yeah. which we will then reference include by reference within the, the article going to town meeting what do you mean by that um uh so in you know the the application will have to be updated to you know to capture any conversations we've had during the application process this being one of them um and just that uh uh um the the town intends for this this railing to uh, remain a feature of the downtown landscape okay. for the next hundred years. Yep. Yeah. You know, something to, to that effect. I think sure. preserves the town's interest in it. Yeah. Um, I think that might have, I don't know if I actually said PR or not, but I think that might have been my question from last time. And my, the only thought that I had really was, you know, with the Main Street project as an example, you know, there was a lot of disruption to the town common and um, there's still certain features, like historic features that are missing currently from it that used to be there. And, um, you know, in the future, there could be a new road project or something that might go through there. And that was my only concern about, uh, you know, protecting this investment. But I think it's, I agree, it's pretty unlikely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with that, I don't think we have any uh, outstanding questions that we need to, to, to get answers to. Um, you know, we're, as we said to, to Nate previously, we're, you know, we're anxiously awaiting uh, to learn uh, the, 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 the status of the CPA fund balance that's going to be available for this year. Um, uh, it sounds like this is a wildly popular project, um, and uh, I'm, I'm confident there'll be funds at least, at least for this one. Um, but we still, of course, have to wait until we know for sure. And, uh, um, you know, when that point comes, uh, we would get back in touch just to talk about getting the application updated. I think will be the last piece of the puzzle. Um, sure. This was a great. great this, this was a really complete and great application. And I know you credited Bill with that. And I will again say, great job, Bill. You, you made it a lot easier for us and answered a lot of the questions um, right from the get-go. So thank you. I was very good at the, just the one page get right to the point. <laughs> yeah. I like that. <laughs> no beating around the bush. Yep. Well, thank you very much for, for coming in this evening. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Can I get my paper? 
Am I staying because... Yes. <laughs> yes. Are you going to the... Doing well. How are you, Kevin? Shall I stay? All right. Yes, please. Uh, yes, so uh, the Rural Cemetery Water Tower Historic Preservation. And uh, please keep Bill on the line because he, he may want to weigh in on this. We've worked um, quite closely to get this together. I have some photos I'd love to share if you wanted to... Um, Make me a co-host. Okay, thank you. I don't, I'm not seeing the option to share my screen, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you made me panelist, I believe. Maybe I have to start my video. Oh, I am. I am. Okay, sorry. My my mistake. I don't really need my mug. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Um, should I just talk, or do you want to ask questions, or how do you want to do this? Well, if you want to give us just a quick, a quick rundown, um, that would be fantastic. Okay, sure. I, you know, this tower is really a, is a really fascinating. I mean, aesthetically, it's a wonderful um, component of town history and the rural cemetery, but it also tells it a really, really interesting story about actually water usage in the town. Um, essentially, you know, the, the rural cemetery um, had a problem around the turn of the 20th century with um, trying to stay green. And uh, the Cemetery commissioners came to town meeting to ask for money to for an irrigation system, and you're looking at the um, part of the result. Um, town meeting appropriated in 1900 was the initial appropriation um, for a system that would involve um, a windmill, a well, a windmill to pump the water up from the well into this tower. And on the second story of the tower, there was a tank. Um, to receive the water, and then they could um, irrigate by gravity um, the shrubbery and the the grass and so on um, in the summer months. And um, it took several years to get the tower built because um, actually they they dug the well, um, erected the windmill, and then apparently iron piping was very expensive in those days, and they ran out of money, so they had to come back to town meeting. Um, for uh, an additional appropriation, and those funds were granted. And so finally, in, in 1903, um, you got the tower that you see here. And I'm, I want to, if I can quickly find it, um, kind of messed up my, my paperwork here. Um, sorry. Ah, here it is. Okay. Um, you know, they paid uh, one Lewis Mitchell $75 for um, miscellaneous labor. They paid for surveying $5.40. But the main expenditure was for one George F. Cantello, um, who was buried in the rural cemetery and who actually built this tower um, with his own hands and was paid $197.31. Um, for his labor. It's, it's just fascinating. So um, completed in 1903, it went into usage, and it um, served the town um, irrigating the cemetery for some 30 years. And actually, it, it, this was all changed by the coming of the municipal supply. A town meeting voted um, in December of 1929 to install a municipal supply to deal with the 
the fact that they had sort of turbidity issues and, and the water just wasn't very good um, being drawn straight from the area reservoirs. Um, and by the, by the end of 1930, they had half of the town hooked up already. Um, however, um, the municipal supply, obviously the rural cemetery being a lower priority because it already had water, um, wasn't hooked up until 1933. Uh, and the town report for 1933 shows that um, the town spent about $258 laying new pipe um, new meter for the water and so on. They actually used Civil Works Administration labor, which is very interesting because this was during the Depression. So this was a, a, a FDR, you know, um, works project kind of um, administration. That that was about half the cost was for laborers to lay the pipe. Anyway, so they got municipal, municipal supply hooked up in 1933, and this tower came out of commission, um, and it's been used ever since. Really, it, it, what it stands now is a kind of, you know, architectural folly. I mean, it's very beautiful to look at. Um, I'm sure everyone, know, you know, knows this thing. And it's interesting because, the, I, you know, I got involved in this in a, somewhat of a roundabout way. It was a bit over a year ago where Mr. Cundiff, um contacted me. You know, he was um, you know, pretty new on the job and immediately sort of sized this tower up, I think, and realized that, you know, it's this beautiful asset that the town has, but it really desperately needed a roof. That was the most pressing concern, because it's, I can show you a couple of these photos, it's pretty appalling, um, the, the condition of the roof. And so he inquired of me if I knew anything about the history of the tower and what the roof was or should be. Um, so I started digging, and it was really interesting for me because one of the things I discovered is that a lot of people in the town had no idea what this tower was for, yep. what it had ever been used for. I heard people were telling me that gunpowder had been stored in it. They were sort of conflating that with the way the rural cemetery did have such a structure at one point. Not the rural cemetery, I'm sorry, the old burial ground had such a structure at one point. But nobody knew what this tower was, what it was for. I was still fairly new to town. I didn't know what it was for or how it had been used. So I started researching um, just to try to get a bill and answer on this. Um, and it coincided actually with um, the conclusion of the signage project for the National Register District. You know, we put the seven bronze signs at the entry point, got really great support um, from capital planning at one point in the select board. Um, and um, we underspent. We came in under budget by about 2,500 bucks. And I was asked by the select board, what did I want to do with the excess money? Um, and I proposed three things, two of which got the thumbs up. And they were, um, I wanted a, a thousand bucks for the historic house sign program, which we were trying to reboot, which we got. Um, I proposed, it was a purely symbolic gesture, but you see the fruits of it, um, $1,000 for the fencing around the common, which we just talked about, because we, historical, wanted to put our money where our mouth was on that, because we'd been yapping about it for a long time. <laughs> um, and then I asked for 500 bucks for a plaque to mark this tower to let people know what it was. And you can see that that plaque is now on there. It went up about a month ago, um, thanks to the good folks at DPW and Chris Leroy. Um, put it up, there it is. Um, and that was ordered and, and I had guessed how much it was gonna cost and I was off by $4. <laughs> it cost $504. So that's what it says, you know, built in 1903, prior to the laying of municipal water pipes in the cemetery in 1933, a windmill pumped well water to a holding tank in this tower, built by George Cantello to provide irrigation to the grounds in summer. We really wanted people to know what this is, and it's just such a fascinating um, sort of story. So anyway, I, so that's how I went down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out this tower, what it was, what, the one thing I did not, um, uh, I couldn't find any photos or any documentation as to what the roof had been. Um, so I let, I let Bill know that, and I, I, but I did speculate, however, that asphalt shingles were only invented in 1903. So it was quite like, unlikely 
that the original roof had been asphalt shingles, and my speculation, I think is pretty reasonable, was that it was cedar shakes. Um, like, likely not slate, it might still be there if it were slate. It was probably cedar shakes. Um, so this started a, a kind of long conversation um, with Bill about the larger maintenance issues. You can see by the picture of the sign that's currently on the door now um, that the door desperately needs to be refinished. Um, and we have an, actually a nice photo of when those doors were, um, there are replacement doors and they were only put in about 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and when, and Bill was nice enough to send me a photo of what they look like when they went in. It looks spectacular, and they can again. Um, they're, you know, definitely salvageable. Um, so it was a look at the roof, a look at the um, rafters. The tower has, if I can show you these photos, it has as you go around, that's an oct octagonal roof, right? Um, eight sided. And there are those, if you see those windows there, those are. They're covered with kind of louvered shutters that provide ventilation, but there's, there are four of those. So this is this, um, the southern exposure of the tower. Um, that, that's again looking south. You see the door. The door face is roughly east. Um, there's a window on the east facing side. Um, again, that's south, and I, I took a couple south photos for a reason. I'll explain to you in a second. Um, that's one of the reasons. But that gives you an idea. You know, there's some work that needs to be done on those. Of the four windows in the tower, for instance, one of them is missing its sill, the south window. Um, almost all of them have some damage. They're actually fairly sound um, to my eye, but, you know, some of them, if you see, there's a broken louver on that one. There's another one that's, that one is the one missing its sill. You see at the bottom? Um, so there's some issues, there. and see this one is a cutout up in the, like midway up on the left. So there's repair work that needs to be done there. Um, some damage, I'll show you up on the roof. This is looking up under the roof. And you can see that under the soffits of this building, you see like there's a big gaping hole right there. Now that's where it looks, that board is scribed around the stone. And I think there's some, there's a missing stone there, some missing mortar. So there's some patching that needs to be done. The, the, the stonework itself and the mortar, um, and Bill, please correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, but to my judgment, looks pretty sound. Um, you know, again, but there is some minor work up there under the soffit that needs to be done. The soffits themselves, I think I said in my application, and I, I, I picked this up somehow in the wind and I was mistaken. Um, spoke, Bill and I spoke about this just the other day, and he doesn't think the, the contractors that looked at this have not identified any um, soffit damage. I had indicated that was a possibility in the, so okay. that's some good news there. Of course, it, it needs to, Soffit, the, the rafters that you can see this has exposed rafter tails that come out from underneath, and that's actually, you're looking up under the roof. That said, you always have to have the caveat that you don't know until you get in there what you're going to find, you know. So once they start tearing things down, you might find that there's some deterioration in some rafters and soffits. Maybe some of the sheathing up top needs some work. But it actually... But for the paint loss, for instance, that photo looks pretty good. Um, that's another view of, again, looking up under the roof. It's meant to be that way. That's sort of a decorative element. Um, and it's really quite attractive. Um, that's the worst part of the roof. And you can see it looks like it's 100 years. I mean, it's a terrible, terrible. <laughs> that's south, that's south um, west, that particular exposure. So the roof is in, you know, pretty rough shape. Now, I want to go back because one of the questions um, you folks queried me about was, if you notice, there's a raised planting bed that comes off. This is, this again, the south side of the tower that kind of goes off in a rectangle um, and allows for planting. And in the center of that bed, um, oh, let me just... 
catch up to it, is a stone you can see in some of these photos right there that notes a, a trust fund. And I know one of your questions was, is there money um, available in that family trust? And I, I did, I had a, a, a fairly long conversation with um, Sam Stivers, who's you know, on the board of the commissioners of trust funds. I always mess up the name of that group, but, and you know, he made clear, of course, that he wasn't speaking for the full group, only for his own views. Um, but with regard to, um, this goes to the alternate funding question. Yeah. Um, you know, he said to me that the cemetery fund has about a million dollars in it, and which is going to spin off about 40 grand a year. And, you know, and his perspective, and I must say I agree with it wholeheartedly, is that in the case of the water tower, it is not an operational element in the cemetery at this point. Is it, it is an historic artifact, beautiful to look at, critical to Southboro's history, in my view, especially in terms of the sort of civic development and the municipal um, um, structure and operations. Um, but it's not, you know, since 1930, it's basically been a place where they put some rakes in there once yep. in a while, you know, like, and it's probably full of bats and small animals at this point because it's got a lot of openings. Um, <clears throat> But it's not operational. So his, you know, his view of it was that, um, as you may know, they've got like a, a one among other issues over there. One big serious issue with the retaining wall, that's mm. <laughs> got a big lean in it and all kinds of problems and going to cost them a fortune. Um, so, you know. And then with regard to the specific Newell Leary trust fund. I was intrigued by that as well because it's right there at the base of the tower. Um, that fund was begun by Frank Newell in 1951 to provide funds, this is a quote now, for the care of the Newell Leary lot. That's simply a family plot in the um, rural cemetery with excess for rural cemetery general care and improvement. Um, now, that... Um, raised bed, like if you look at that, if you see that photo right there, that needs some, that raised bed needs some work, um, some masonry work, and actually that very corner that's in the lower right-hand corner, I, I could, I was there this afternoon, you could lift the concrete up there and place it back down, it's just broken off. So I think you can make an argument that the, um, that Newell Fund, um, that maybe that you know the board of commissioners of trust funds could be prevailed upon to provide a little money to fix up that general area, but I don't honestly think it pertains to the tower. Um, and and again, I, I'm I'm supportive of the idea that um, this being a non-operational element, you know, being a historic artifact, that it's more you know. I know everyone wants to keep their own money, but I think Sam's view was, I thought, reasonable um, on that point. Um, now, the, with regard to the proposal, right, we, you know, we asked for twenty thousand um, uh, dollars. Mr. Cundiff has, has gotten, you know, several different bids um, from the same company with different options. Um, there was, at, you know, at one point um, there was a thought about replacing those doors altogether, and I, I, I was very clear that, that, you know, I knew that CPC would not go for that, like a, no, you know, yeah, but a preservation, I do, but not a right. I do have some question though for you about, um, <clears throat> for instance, the the window slits, right? There are those four, and those are wood, and you know, I know. Um, Bill and Chris had a thought that, um, uh, you know, everyone puts now, if they can, you, you know, AZAC or PVC, th that's indistinguishable from wood when painted um, on those kinds of locations that take a lot of serious beating weather-wise. I, I don't know what your rules are on something like that. Is that acceptable? Um, 
So we've, we've run into that with uh, uh, the historic preservation of windows uh, on, on a number of projects through the years. And um, uh, the Massachusetts Historical Commission, they're the, wait, is it they or the Secretary of the Interior issued the preservation standards regarding windows, Freddie? It's the interior, okay, yeah. 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 Um, uh, and we ran into that here, you know, in the townhouse is one of the places, as well as South Union School with those windows. And uh, they're very particular. Right. And, and they want the preservation of the, the physical windows that are, that are in place. Yeah, and I think that's fine. It's yeah. not, it, again, and Bill can weigh on in this, but it's not that big a deal. Yeah. There, it's fairly small potatoes carpentry in the grand scheme of things to fix those, replace a sill, a couple broken louvers. And I find them quite sound. I was wrapping on them this afternoon just to make sure that I was, you know, I think it's pretty good. The other question uh, I had, because again, Bill and I have, have discussed this is, again, I surmise that the original roof was shakes. Yep. Um, I think Chris and, you know, and I understand where they're coming from, you know, we're advocating for an architectural um, asphalt shingle. That's what's on, an asphalt shingle's on there now. That's just an ugly three-tab piece of junk, in my opinion. Um, because of the weathering issues. Um, but, you know, th there are options with, depending on what um, you folks w would be interested in. We could have an absolutely stellar looking copper roof yep. that would last 60 to 80 years. You could have a zinc roof that would last 100 years. You could have slate. You could have um, go back with the cedar that's going to give you 40. Um, or an architectural asphalt shingle that would do the job and look very handsome that might give you 30 to 35. So, you know. I imagine a standing seam on that octagonal roof, a standing seam copper roof oh. would, would be stunning. A showstopper. And in the grand scheme of things, not that expensive. This is a way lower, obviously, dollar amount than the fence, you know, ironically, even though it's a bigger structure. So I, I was really open to um, hearing what, and I, I'm, you know, I'm sitting here on as, representing historical, trying to, you know, defend best practices historically, but also be understanding of the needs of DPW. They're the ones that have to take care of this thing and, you know, and try to have some realistic balance. Look, in our house sign program, right, they used to be wood hand-painted, a house painter sign, and I discovered that almost all of Eastern Massachusetts, everybody that was running a program like this was in the same boat as us, couldn't find a, a, a house sign painter, or if they could, it was cost prohibitive. So now we have our signs made locally in Southboro by Signorama, and they're PVC. Yeah. And they look beautiful, and they're gonna last way longer than the wood ones, and I had to bend on the my I can't be such a purist about it. So, but I know that CPC has very specific rules. Yeah. So, as far as as far as the roofing material goes, the, um, for an asphalt shingle, the the answer is is very easy because that's what's there now. Preserving what's there now, there's there's no question about that. Uh, we would need to check in with uh, the coalition to see uh, uh, if the the cedar shake. Uh, would be allowed because there's a reasonable belief that that was what was there originally. We would need to check in with them on that. Okay. We have to be very careful that we don't try to uh, recreate history or uh, something that we've seen elsewhere, um, uh, create something that's consistent with what could have been there. Um, that's something that I, I, I know we can't for sure fund. Right. Um, uh, and then just I understand uh, uh, um, Sam's, uh, Sam Stiver's uh, concerns with the, uh, the cemetery trust fund. I guess the, the counter to that is that the tr you know, that, that trust fund is used uh, in, in the grand scheme of things for maintaining the aesthetics of the cemetery, with, the, with maintaining the landscaping, uh, the mowing, the beautiful trees, 
the paths, the walls, um, and, and the buildings that are used as part of the maintenance effort. Um, and, and, you know, I, I do think you're right. Everyone wants to try to preserve, uh, uh, you know, the funds that are under their stewardship. Um, and so I, I, I understand his perspective. I, I, I think there's a very strong argument that uh, this, uh, this beautiful tower uh, is a, you know, is an important part of the aesthetics of the cemetery. And, and this is, this is a, a typical use of, of those funds. Um, perhaps there's, um, just speaking as one member of the committee, some, some way for some type of uh, sharing of the costs. Um, so that's what I have to say, but I think we should go down the line here and uh, hear from everybody. All right, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Kevin, I appreciate it. Again, another great application. Um, I'm only gonna expand, I think, a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, on what Ben said. You know, in, in looking at the inventory form, it talks that the, in 1900, the town's annual report showed funding allocated to build a water supply for the cemetery. So, uh, again, looking at the perpetual fund for the cemetery, um, it's, we're not talking a million dollars for one thing. I think $20,000, Kevin, no matter where it comes from, this needs to happen. Yeah. So don't, don't, don't get any of us wrong. It, it certainly needs to happen. I would think if it came from the perpetual fund, there's A, less restrictions on it. B, it could happen tomorrow. You wouldn't have to wait for town meeting. And, you, you know, you talked about a roof and, and the shutters, and that could take place tomorrow if, again, if the perpetual fund did that. My, my one question for you, Ben, is if – we do the maintenance on this. Is there a PR because it's a building? I mean, what, what, how would this work? On, I mean, it's only $20,000. Yeah, so. and, and that's a tough question because, uh, um, you know, we've, we've seen the difficulty in getting a PR on a large project like the townhouse <coughs> and the library facade. Yeah. And just my, my concern is, is that we simply would not be able to find a holder uh, for a PR. Uh, I, I've been thinking about this a lot. It's 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 tough, and I think uh, um, I think we ought to have a syndicate of commu of local communities where we hold PRs for each other to get around yeah. this problem. Um, Cause that's but, my concern: is I don't know how we fund this. What's the level of guarantee that typically on a structure is required? Yeah. What would it be on this? I don't know. Um, it would be a, a, certainly a discussion for the committee. Um, um, as one committee member, I'd be very worried about, about being able to find a holder for a PR. Um, the, the discussion could also, you know, cover other ways of trying to address this, like what, what we were talking about um, with, the, with the railing. Um, can we memorialize it within the application and include that by reference in the article? It certainly doesn't hold to the same standard that a PR would, but... Um, um, we at least get down on paper the intent and the, ingre the agreement to, to maintain it into the future. Um, okay. Yeah, but again, a subject for discussion. You know, can I, turn, I, I listened to your, your meeting last week with a, a great deal of interest because I know you talked about, you know, PRs and, and who was holding it, you know, on, on several applications. And, and my thought was, of course, again, as chair of historical, I certainly appreciate the impulse um, and and I because you asked that question in the, at the end of the, the list of questions that were submitted to me and, and I, I thought a lot about it and and I thought well if if you know the CPC folks had a willingness to to pay for it I certainly take one <laughs> on the tower that said I don't consider the tower other than this maintenance problem, to be at risk, obviously. No one's ever going to develop this right. <laughs> land or turn it into more graves or, you know, uh, do something with it. And so it seems to me um, a safe one, you know, yeah. similar to the, to the fence around the common, that, that we're making a commitment as a community to, to spend m money on this tower and on this right. fence. We're... we're you know, bloody well going to keep it and no one, you know, I just don't, I don't see the, I, I th this is a very personal view that I always see PRs as most useful for buildings that are actually under threat. Um, and I don't see the, 
the water tower is uh, being under threat? So our uh, concern with, with, with uh, PRs comes from guidance from mm -hmm. the uh, Massachusetts Department of Revenue. Right, and, that, and that's yeah. why I was listening. So yeah. it was so interesting to, to hear your perspective on it. And so at, at my answer to this question was, I just want to hear what they, yeah. what you guys want. You know, we, so we are, you know, we are, in, and it's only in the past couple of years where this is really, we've really gained a deeper understanding of this. You know, it's, it's if you saw our last meeting, so, you know, CPA is a relatively young piece of legislation and it's, it's a learning process. And, and, and with the DOR's guidance from 2019, uh, we are tasked with ensuring that there's a, you know, a public benefit to these, these funds that are spent. Um, which is which is easy when it's spent on a public project that we can establish that easily. But we have to ensure that that benefit remains uh, um, in the long term. And and the DOR says the way that that is done is through a PR. Um, How so, much would it cost to to do that for? A so. Uh, I'm It's a small building, and I, I would guess it would, well, first, we couldn't get a PR on just the roof, you know, you know so, in uh, in we, you know, there's not a proposal right now to be doing work on the structure itself, so this may not, uh, I think there is, isn't there? The work is to do the door, the windows, the roof. Oh, I'm, the, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me. Right, I think, yeah, right. So, so we would be talking about the, the exterior of preserving the exterior mm -hmm. of the building. Um, if there was somebody willing to hold a, a PR on a structure this, this small, I, I would imagine it, it would be, it would scale with the building to some degree, so, but it would probably cost about as much as the repairs, maybe even a shade more. Right. And, and why I even bring this up, Kevin, is, is, is in looking at this and the restrictions that CPC funds or CPA funds would, could potentially put on this, it might be more cost-effective and worthwhile to just take the funds out of the perpetual fund get done what needs to get done, some of the improvements that you talked about potentially on the roof, you know, still keep it historic, but um, again, you're not talking a PR. Unfortunately, we're bound by certain restrictions, you know, and um, so again, that's, I'm supportive of the project, 100%. How it gets funded, I'm interested to hear what the rest of, the, you know, the members of the committee think as well, but I think you and, and Bill as well should probably think about what's the, easiest way to get this done and um, that creates the least of problems, if I can use that word, for, you know, getting it done. You know, again, doing things to the um, standards of the, what is it, the Secretary, Secretary of Interiors, of you know what I mean? So again, I, I'm supportive however we do this, but it's just what is actually the best way for you to get done what you need to get done, that's all. Right, yeah, I'd just say that, you know, like I think <clears throat> the wood is very easy to address on this building and to keep exactly as wood. Um, and I, um, when this came up in our discussions, it, there was an awareness that, for instance, um, any artificial material might not fly and everyone's fine with that and understands it. And then with regard to the roof, you know, I could live with either alternative, a nice architectural shingle or the cedar um, and I, I think bill could as well so it, and you know if you look at that pr question it, arguably a pr and i don't think we think it's important at all uh, would be more important on this fence than on that tower because that tower is not going anywhere grant's idea well what if somebody changed the contours of the downtown or yeah. wanted to reroute the road or you know um so i, I you know i just it, it's just a it's just a personal thing and like i said i i was open it but i was concerned about the idea that a pr on that tower which i don't perceive as at risk mm -hmm. um would be more expensive than the repairs you know yeah. it's a structure um, i just don't know what yeah. the, Sorry. Um, I, I just don't know what the guidelines are for a structure, Kevin. Can I just one right. quick question. Sure. Is, is, it, uh, is the rural cemetery in the historic district? It is. It is. Yes. Um, and it's, um, 
in the, the National Register uh, form listing, you know, okay. inventorying it, um, the rural cemetery and the tower are specifically discussed. Okay. Um, so it does have that also. And again, just you know, so everybody knows, right, that National Register listing doesn't convey any um, restrictions or protections. So the, the reason I, the reason I ask, and if Freddie was the one who, who keyed right in on this, right. uh, if, you get the, if you get an MPPF grant, then the PR is a no-brainer because it's held by the Massachusetts Historical Commission. Right. And that's the only way to get them to hold of it. When they hold it, uh, there's no cost. Right. And, yeah. Well, we could look in that direction, similar to with, with the fence, and yeah. I, I'd be happy to do it. I, I would say that, you know, one thing, and um, nobody on the slick board is currently still here, but um, th it would be great to have the, um, you know, we have the, um, um, uh, oh gosh, I, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm just spacing on her name at the moment. Um, for the EDC, the... Leah. The, the, Leah, the, thank you, Leah Emerson. Um, you know, I, I would love to have access to a grant writer myself because this is not my wheelhouse, you know? Like, and I, you know, it's really hard. I have no experience writing grants. I know, you know, I know we know about the Massachusetts Preservation Projects Fund and all that stuff, but it, it, it's a little bit dizzying to oh, understood, you know, go through that when you you know you've got to learn all those rules and and you know as a volunteer it's a little bit, <laughs> yeah. it's a it's a tough one, um, but that that's another argument for another board I guess. Um, well, yeah. That's all so, I have. Okay. Yeah. Um, in in we we will go down the line and get get comments and questions from everybody. I think the uh, the discussion about um, uh, the protection of the building is is one we should have. You know the DOR. Uh, uh, issues guidance. We are, it's, it's not a legislative requirement that we have a PR on the building, uh, but it is guidance from the DOR. But I think we can legitimately have a discussion about this particular building and it's mm -hmm. how it is specifically situated uh, uh, and if there are some special features of it or, or its situation that we could address differently. Um, um, keeping in mind the fact that we're going to have other projects coming before us in the future where we're going to be asking for, yeah. for PRs. You know, how, how are we going to balance, balance that? So anyhow, a discussion for us to have later on, but I don't want to keep anybody else from, from seeing their piece. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you for putting this application together. Um, I think all of the historical detail about the cemetery itself was really interesting to see and to have included in there was great, so thank you for that. Um, I think I'm curious, it's not necessarily a question for you, but more about the specific charge of the, the cemetery trust and understanding what it does and could um, support, how that process works. Um, so maybe just more research on my side to understand that, um, because I think that could be a, a valuable place, and as Lisa mentioned, with a lot fewer restrictions. Um, and I was just also curious when the asphalt roof was put on to the structure. I don't know. I would guess at least 30 years ago. I don't know if Bill has an opinion. I don't. Um, I think, Kevin, you, you've done all the research on this, and you probably know better than anybody. <laughs> That's a guess. It's it's appallingly bad <laughs> I, I you know I'm, I just sit here in the position of somebody who looks at that thing loves it knows the history thinks it's so important to the town and by the way if you google cemetery water towers what you mostly see are these ugly you know like a typical steel monstra this is a very unusual asset it's not Go around area towns. You're not going to see one of these in every town. Other towns do have some stone towers, and it's. I'm not saying this is a one of a kind, but it's special, you know. So, from my position, I'm very flexible. I'm, I'm flexible in how we do it, how we protect it, where the money comes from, what the material is. I just want the thing buttoned up and I think that was um, and I really I, I love working with Bill and he's a, a pleasure to, to, 
to work on this stuff with. And he, he's the same way. And again, it started with Bill coming to me going, the roof on this thing is shot. We got to fix it. And here we are. So, Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for that. Um, and I think just also, I guess I'm the, the maintenance person tonight, um, but wondering about that question here as well, that you mentioned the doors are about 15 years old. Um, the roof is maybe 30-ish years old. Um, but just how we can make sure with another our future investment in this that those things are maintained, whatever that roof material is. Um, you mentioned the love different lifespans, but how do we make sure it, it gets to well, I, Bill and Chris were um, <clears throat> helpful in this, and you know they simply answered that cemetery funds should be able to cover the maintenance, um, and that, and, and again, you know, we're in a new day and a new regime here, so um, I think the the there's a I don't want to speak for Bill, but I there's a clear understanding that you know. I'm, I'm, like the the one proposal is you know marine varnish on the doors and that has to be renewed what would you say bill every five or six years probably yeah uh you know it, it's just it, it's so difficult when you get these very specific tiny projects to really focus on them and get them on a routine schedule the big projects are easy believe it or not it, it's the little ones like this that require the maintenance so i mean from my selfish perspective that's why i prefer you know uh newer materials newer products that are less maintenance and have the longevity there but i also appreciate kevin's passion which is clearly evident tonight um and his his uh, eloquence with what he what he's spoken to um it, it you know but I'm not answering your question, but um, routine maintenance is essential for all components of any kind of structure, as you all know. Um, something like this is easy to slip between the cracks when we're focused on the larger issues, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Sure. Thank you, and we, we appreciate the amount of things that DPW has on your plate. Um, so I think it's just from past experience of funded projects of making sure that that is a focus. But that was all I had, but thank you. Uh, Kevin, I think uh, you know how I feel about this uh, tower. I voted for the application to, to be submitted um, at our last meeting, so. Um, and I also took a walk over and looked at it a couple weeks ago or a month ago or something on a beautiful fall day, so it was good to see it up close and up close and personal. Um, so I do have a few questions. Um, one was, I think it was Brett's question actually from, Brett's not here tonight, but um, from uh, the technical review was um, somewhere in the application it says that the requested funding would be at minimum 20,000, whereas the actual amount like at the top of the, the top line is 20. Um, and so just wondering if the request is for 20 or if you go above that, um, what do you think the upper end would be? That's not to say that I wouldn't be supportive of whatever the upper end would be. I just want to. Yeah, I, I think that's somewhat in, in flux. And I, I came in wanting to hear what your thoughts were on PVC materials, roofing. Um, we had gotten some actually good news that that was lower than that. Um, but I'm also. Um, looking at, you know, for instance, today, noticing that there's some masonry work, very light masonry work needed around that sort of scrim of the roof. Um, and there, you know, there's a windowsill that wasn't noted in the, in the bid that needs to be replaced. And, you know, they're fairly minor issues, but I, I still, I still, again, I, Bill can chime in on this. Um, I still feel pretty confident, actually, in the 20,000 um, as, again, it depends on the roofing material, you know, but yeah. pretty close to the top line. I, it's not one of these things that, again, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not, I'm saying 20, it's going to be 40, I think. Well, so the, the reason I'm asking is not that I disagree with, let's just say, if it comes in at 30 or anything like yeah. that, but um, the reason I'm asking is that we are appropriating the money and I think it's better to over-appropriate in my book so that you have the, you know, 
let's just say you, were, you overestimate by $5,000 or something, that way you don't have to come back to a town meeting in the future and um, you know, start, As start work in 2026 tower, right? instead yeah. of 2025 or, um, you know, I think it gets very messy or something. So I just want to make sure that whatever we end up going with, if we do, you know, support this application. Right. And I, I think yeah. as the process goes along, I understood this is something that unfolds over the course of months. We can, you know, refine this mm -hmm. um, maybe a little bit better. I mean, I, I really, I came in very open-minded wanting to get your feedback so yeah. that... And I will say, you know, in, in once uh, a refined estimate is put together, it's it's been our policy for several years now to always include a contingency as well yes. of 10%. Yeah. That, you know, if you go over, you have to, uh, um, you know, come talk with us before accessing that contingency. But we don't want to have a project where it's so close to the goal line and they run out of money, you know, $4,000 short or something. Uh, so we've always included that contingency. We'll, we'll, we would presumably do that that here as well. Um, I, I, I appreciate that, especially because I tend to be cheap with the town's money. <laughs> you know, I really do. I, I have a tendency to under, yep. you know, um, just because it's your tax dollars and mine. And you know. um, I will say, applicants have been have been uh, uh, fantastic uh, in the overwhelming majority of the time have not had to access the uh, the contingency. Like one of the biggest projects we funded was the townhouse restoration and John Parent uh, was able to pull off this beautiful project without touching it, right. which has been fantastic. So anyhow. So actually, I did want to talk about the townhouse, if you, if you don't mind. Yes. Uh, oh, were you going to say something, Freddie? Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Um, so about roof... This is mainly for the committee, but about the roof. Um, so I was at the meeting last year, I believe, when um, John Parent came. Yes. He had underspent the money. Um, he had excess funds available. Yep. And they made, and we authorized the switch from an asphalt, I think it was asphalt, right, to a slate roof. Yes. So in that um, instance, I know you had mentioned, uh, you know, you can't recreate right. history. So was there evidence that the townhouse had previously been a state, slate oh, roof? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, in, photographic evidence. Okay. Yeah. So the difference here is that we don't have any photos of what the roof used to be, and we weren't, we aren't sure exactly. So yeah, uh, if it turns know, out to be cedar or slate or something, we can't. Um, I feel uh, more positive than not that it would ultimately be okay to use the cedar because there's a reasonable, you know, the material basically had not been invented when the original roof was put on. So uh, um, cedar is overwhelmingly likely to have been the material. Um, so I, I suspect we would be able to find a way to do that. We would want to check with the, the Community Preservation Coalition to make sure we're not missing something obvious and, and not making a, a misstep. Um, but yeah, no, I, you're right, Grant. We, and that was the reason why we were able to do that here. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see. Okay, so one that I don't, I still don't have a firm grasp on this, but I, I thought I'd bring it up because we've mentioned it for other applications, is that um, apparently we require site control of the, yep. of uh, either you having control of the site or it sounds like select board authorization. I think we still have a, a request out on that, but um, I know the Historical Commission doesn't control the cemetery, so would Kevin need to get a letter from the select board saying we authorize? Uh, I believe with, uh, with Bill as uh, uh, one of the applicants here, um, it is his, uh, uh, part of his duties as DPW director is the, the maintenance of, of, this, uh, of the cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, Was he that is correct. Excuse me? Is he an applicant? Bill? Uh, I would say so. Uh, the project, we can, Kevin really put, put the application together, but we, really it was at our request uh, through the DPW. And, and, and certainly getting a letter from the selectmen, I do not think is a heavy lift in this, in this particular instance. Uh, um, and Kevin, I don't think that would even require attendance at a meeting or anything. I think uh, Yeah, I, I agree. I, my view of it, and I did, you know, list, um, Bill and DPW as 
fully on board. I forget yeah. how it's phrased in the, the application, but um, I listened to that aspect of your meeting last week also with great interest, and I yeah. thought to myself, should I, I all, contemplated contacting the select board chair and asking to be on the agenda last night, but I thought, well, yeah. I, I don't wanna, you know, they've already got an agenda set kind of thing, so, sure. I, but I will happily, um, just if you want that, reinforce it with, and I'll go to select yeah. board and ask them. And I know they're supportive of this. Oh yeah, and I'm 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 sure they would be. I you know I, I think it's a matter for the committee. I, I as one committee member, I would be entirely comfortable with. You know the applications get updated up until you know uh, um, CPC conducts its vote on what funding is going to take place. You know. I would be comfortable if the final updated application simply lists as a co-applicant uh, uh, DPW um, because they, oh, sure. they already have site control to do building maintenance uh, on this property. Right, that's how I viewed it um, fr okay. from the outset. And so I, I, I can't find where I, I said that, you know, that um, yeah. DPW was fully on board and that it was working with um, Mr. Condiff. Um, Okay. Yeah, I just didn't, I didn't want to make any. I didn't want to make yeah, your no, life I, harder or anything. I, I just it was an honest. Question, I, I had so. the same yeah. question coming out of your, you know, having watched your meeting last week. I thought the same thing. Mm -hmm. What you know? Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. So the I was the one who brought up the idea of a preservation restriction on it. Um, where I'm coming from is that you know perceptions of these things change over time. Um, what we view as a beautiful stone tower that you know was integral to this town's irrigation, you know, some of that detail we didn't even know, like, you, you, you know, we voted for the sign, right? It was like three months ago or six months ago or something like that. So uh, I think someone else could have easily looked at the tower now as a derelict uh, storage cupboard that needs to go or something like that. <laughs> uh, I don't agree with that, but um, so the reason, and you know the value of preservation restrictions, so I don't have to explain it to you, but even though it is town-owned land, I think we see that even town owned properties can be at risk even in, in the future. And so, again, I don't know about who would hold it. Um, I, I know it's not probably not best practice, but uh, for the 84 Main Street Historical Commission is the holder, which I don't think was the right choice at that time. But um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, if I could just address that. Uh, the, historic, the Southboro Historical Commission can't hold a preservation restriction for a town property because of something called, as I understand it, merger doctrine. Okay, never mind. Scratch that. Like, yeah, uh, it's it, I, honestly, I I, I don't think it, it's a good idea anyway. But just okay. like, if literally nobody else would hold it and it's cheap to do, then like, I maybe. But yeah, okay. In thinking about that, I I thought it was a good idea only because, in in I think in cases like this, it might be the only. It, you know, it would be the only way to make it happen, but the law forbids it. So, yeah. Um, but, so that's where I'm coming from is, again, partly protecting the investment in the building, which again, I don't think is really at risk, but you really, you really don't know what's going to happen down the road. And I think we've been burned previously with projects that we thought were, or buildings that we thought were safe. We invested in and then, you know, are or, or were at risk later down down the road so i think that's yeah. that's where i'm coming from on that i don't know about the mechanics of right. who would hold it or how much it would cost but um yeah thank you Grant. and that's it for me um i'll just try to keep it brief um but so definitely think we should be preserving it right or restoring it or stabilizing it um i don't really think we should be trying to upgrade it um, to be honest, right? Um, if it's asphalt today, it should be asphalt. Um, it's not very visible, let's be honest, right? I mean, if you're in the cemetery, it's beautiful. You might see it passing on the road, but it's not like it's right on Main Street, right? So when I say that, I'm not saying we shouldn't put money into it, because I do think we wouldn't want to lose it, but I don't think we just have to chase it. Um, that's just my perspective. Also, if the, if the preservation restriction is going to cost as much as the the thing, so at some point, like, you know, we're trying to, I think my perspective is trying to balance costs and, you know, do as many projects as we can. Um, the Newell Fund, the family fund, is that part of the million dollars? Is that a separate trust? What amount is that? Do we know? I believe that's a separate. A separate and, and how much does that trust have? Th that I don't, uh, well, let me see if I have it. Just more out of curiosity. I do not know the, the exact amount, but again, it, 
the, it is principally directed toward the care of that particular family plot. And yep. it's odd that there's that marker yeah. in this raised flower bed because I, I, you know, I hadn't really thought about it. And then I got your questions back and I, I had to go down there and look at it. I'm like, oh, wow, yeah. Am I missing something? And it turns out not really. Yeah. Yeah. It's more just out of curiosity because yeah. if the, the cemetery is a fund over a million bucks and this other family, I mean, it's, it's just more about right. sourcing of funds and everything. Um, I'd be a big fan of matching, right? right. You know? Um, yeah. And I do agree. I don't know if a preservation restriction is necessarily required in the middle of this cemetery. I don't think, you know. And also, I also want to be careful of, well, if someone decides or, you know, DPW decides they actually want to put something in, I don't necessarily oppose to that, right? Um, you know, but the idea of replacing the, the wood slats, you know, great. The doors have to be replaced in the field. Like, I think this is a good use of funds, but I think my perspective would be stabilize it, make sure it does not fall down, um, and that way it's still there. Um, but those are at least my thoughts. But again, if the cemetery is sitting on a million bucks that's generating forty to 50000 a year, I mean, that's just something to keep in mind. And, you know, but be very much in favor of there was like a match to say you're asking us to pay for half of it or something that'd be a little different but so anyways but those are my thoughts but definitely i think we should figure out how to get funds to it because we don't want this to topple in any way so um, and when i say this too if the cedar were like 500 bucks more than the asphalt shingle i mean it's like it's also more I, there's 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 no cost information that would help us suggest it but again a little bit different if this was on main street then copper could be awesome but I just, it's just a little different that's all so but uh, yeah I, I i mentioned the the other kinds of roofs just as a sort of uh, kind of hypothetical yeah. i i think i think the choice is really between the cedar and the architectural asphalt sort of shingles and that you know i have a soft spot for the cedar i will confess but uh, i think the bill and i had a a little conversation sort of speculating a little bit on how lovely a copper roof would look but it would be gilding the lily it probably wasn't copper it yep. likely was not slate just based on again the time and we, what we know we spent you know right it was probably and that's a utilitarian building um right at the time it wasn't built to be it's beautiful and i will say now that the leaves are coming down you do notice it um dr even driving down Porterville Road, um, you can see it. Yeah. I'll be honest, I mean, I definitely noticed the cemetery. I've been driving past it for over 20 years. Yeah. Very beautiful. Want to see it stabilized. But again, it's, just, it's more just to be realistic about the location of it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, most people don't experience it, right? I'm not saying that's a negative thing, right? It'd be great that they do. But, it, but I think it's more just trying to find a joint way of doing this. But we definitely don't want to lose it. That's for sure. So right. that, that's my only comment. So, but thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so uh, I don't want to uh, uh, create a, a ton of work for you, Kevin. The, the only request that, that, that I would have, uh, just from hearing from Doug and, and Lisa, and I know my feelings on this, um, I don't know how often the commissioners of trusts meet. You know, I know you've spoken with, with Sam himself. Um, I think it may be helpful to speak with the full the full commission um, because I, I I do feel like they have uh, you know the 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 perpetual care trust for the cemetery has an interest in in maintaining the aesthetics of the cemetery I think that's its its you know its principal purpose and and um, and I, I think Doug has a great idea of you know perhaps matching uh, funds in 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 I think. It sounds like there's will here on the committee to certainly take part in this, and everyone, I'm, I'm very supportive of the project. Um, uh, I think it would be entirely appropriate if the uh, perpetual care fund uh, contributed. I, I'd can, be happy to, um, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, Lisa, go ahead. No, just, just quickly, um, Bill, can I just ask you, do you have any say or <clears throat> um, control over the perpetual fund at all? I know in the past there was some issues with some gravestones and, you know, I, when I was still on the select board, I worked with Mark and Karen, you know, and we came up with a plan. And I don't necessarily know that it went through the trust fund. So whether that was done correctly or not, do you have some level of control to some degree over the funds that are in there, Bill? Well, no. To answer your question, no. Um, what we've been doing is our routine maintenance, what we've carried in the past. We've 
you know, proceeded. We've had contracts with landscape companies, for example. Um, so we followed the same pattern. We did not deviate. This is a little bit different, much like that retaining wall that we need to address in the future. Um, that's not routine. So I, I would need to go to the, the trust committee to find out if this was something they'd be willing to fund. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Kevin. No, that, that's fine. I, I'm just gonna say, I'd, I'd be happy to, you know, ask for a, a slot at one of their meetings to, to talk to them. I, and, and, and I, you know, your argument, obviously it perfectly sensible and resonates with me. I, I, I'm balancing, you know, yeah. what you're saying and what, what Sam was saying about, yeah. you know, his operational concerns. And I know about this retaining wall thing because I've looked into it myself and right. I know it's a big deal and it's going to be a big expense. Right. Um, so I get where he's coming from, from the operational perspective, but yeah. um, I'd be happy. I'd love to get you all together and <laughs> make the sale, you know. Um. So I, I'm just going to suggest, and, and Ben, please correct me if I'm wrong here, but it, it would make sense if the trust fund has any questions on why we made the suggestion. Maybe they could like reach out to Ben. Let's streamline this process a little bit. You know, I'm more than happy to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank um, you. So it sounds like uh, on our end, we're going to be checking in with the coalition to to uh, see if it's even possible to uh, to use a different roofing material. Um, and uh, uh, you'll be checking in with the the commissioners of trusts, um, and and if there's a way that I can help with that, please let me know or pass my number along to them. Um, uh, and I'm more than happy to help out there. Uh, and I think that's all that we have outstanding here right now. Um, uh, as we get an answer from, from the coalition or get some guidance there, uh, it sounds like we can sort of refine the numbers uh, and get a, a firmer grasp on that. Um, uh, you know, we, we need to have a, a fairly detailed estimate uh, at the time of putting together an article. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's great. I, I'm so I appreciate all the the questions. Very thoughtful, the support and the immense amount of time you just gave me. And and I think, if, you know, it's nice to know that you want to make this work. I know Bill and I want to make this work. And I think Bill and I are both have to take the attitude that we're flexible. You know, we yep. want to figure out a way that it can be right historically. Maintenance sound for you know try to limit the burden on DPW make it stand and make it beautiful for the town and it's it, it's good to come here and feel some support so it's well, much I'm appreciated glad. 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 yeah thank you thank you for coming in and joining us tonight thank you, Kevin. All right. thanks thank you Bill oh yeah thank you Bill. my pleasure and I want to say thank you again to Kevin because the amount of time and effort he's put into this. We certainly wouldn't be at this point if it wasn't yes, for you. his assistance. Um, and folks, I'm sorry, I, Freddie just caught me. I almost did it again. Uh, if anyone has joined us here from the public here okay. this evening who uh, wishes to ask a question or make a comment, please use the raise hand function on Zoom and we'll promote you up so we can do that. Okay, no hands. Okay, thank you. And with that, I think we've awesome, finished Kevin, everything. Thank you. Have a great, well, Thanks. Have a great rest of your night. What's left? Good night. Good night. Good night, Bill. Okay, uh, chair report, nothing to report. Um, like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so next meeting dates. Uh, we don't have any <laughs> meetings uh, scheduled at this point. Um, let's see. Well, I have the training room on the 6th, so the 6th is probably, unless you do it here, but I the first attend. of November. Oh. Yes, oh, that's right. right. And we need a little time. Yeah, so uh, uh, how about, uh, let's see, I've got a, so three weeks from now, uh, Wednesday the 13th. I can't. Okay. Uh, I've got conservation on Thursday the 14th. Okay. Yeah, the 13th, my sister's in town. Okay. So, yep. and, and she leaves that night, so. Uh, Tuesday. 
Tuesday, again, my sister's here. Until okay. Wednesday. Okay. No, 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 I'm sorry, Grant. I just, I Microphone on, sorry. Thanksgiving is the 28th, yes. What about the 21st? Yeah, are folks available the 21st? I would tell you, but both my phone and laptop have died. Oh, no. Uh, so um, it sounds good. Okay. Uh, um, and we not charging, so. and we start, you know, coordinating uh, a, a little I've beforehand. Used yeah. Yeah. So we'll. I mean, uh, I'm flexible that week, Ben. As am I. The 21st. I mean, I'm, I'm free any night that I could do, that's yeah, Wednesday or Thursday or Monday for that matter. Yeah, same um, but let's pencil it in for the Thursday. Okay. Yeah. But my phone's older. Sometimes it takes a minute to. Okay. Oh yeah, it's definitely much better. How's that look for you, Ellie? I think it's the 21st. 21st. Yep. Yeah, Thursday the 21st. Okay. So can we in, in 10 seconds, you 10 <laughs> seconds we will know. Can we double check with um, Sarah and Brett. Oh yeah, and we'll 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 reach out to Sarah and Brett and make sure that they're available too, but but amongst us here that sounds like a a workable date. And uh, uh, yeah, so I will then be uh, uh, reaching out to uh, Chair of Affordable Housing Trust Fund Committee, Al Hamilton, uh, to schedule uh, uh, his presentation before us on that night. Um, okay, and uh, Thursday the 21st, sorry. Thir Thursday the 21st. Yes, it does work. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Um, let me see, nine. So I'll send out an email once I get confirmation from everyone, make sure that it's a done. Uh, so this is penciled, not, and then they'll ink it. Would that be the, well, the public safety as we can get it? Yeah, this far ahead we should be able to, but yeah. Okay. So next up, uh, we have some outstanding minutes that need to be approved. They were circulated. Uh, comments have been incorporated. Um, folks had a chance to just verify that your comments have been. Um, so the first set were from September 5th. Does anyone have any additional comments or edits to make? And if not, would somebody like to make a motion to uh oh, I just have one thing. oh sure uh, just the top line um lisa is vice chair instead of co-chair i believe right i am okay yes <laughs> i, I think that was actually that's on a, that's thank on you okay. yeah uh, but i think that was it for me okay um would somebody like to make a motion to accept the minutes of september 5th as amended here this evening so moved in a second okay thank you uh we don't have anyone online right now, do. but we are technically a hybrid meeting, so I'll call the roll. Um, Doug Mance? Aye. Uh, Grant Farrington? Aye. Ellen Mario? Aye. Lisa Braccio? Aye. And Ben Smith is a yes. Okay, next up, we have September 30th, uh, which were the minutes that Grant was kind enough to put together for our pre-special town meeting yep. uh, uh, meeting. Any uh, uh, edits? Okay. Would somebody like to make a motion to accept those minutes as written? So moved. And a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, Doug Mance? Aye. Grant Farrington? Aye. Helen Mario? Aye. Lisa Braccio? Aye. Ben Smith is an aye. And uh, we had draft October 16th minutes circulated? Yes? I think we had the, Betsy sent out the August 8th and September 19th today. Oh, excuse me. Yep. September 19th, that's yep. right. And well, I don't think we did August yet, right? We started with the 5th? Yeah, we did not do the August okay. ones, yep. my mistake. Um, okay, so uh, August 8th minutes. Any uh, any edits? Uh, same thing. Um, Lisa is vice chair instead of co-chair on the first line. <laughs> oh, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 
if there's nothing further, is there a motion to accept the minutes as amended? So moved. And a second? Second. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Doug Mance? I don't think I was here present at, or in the committee yet. I'll just abstain. Thank you. Grant Farrington? Aye. Ellen Maria? Aye. Lisa Braccio? Aye. Ben Smith is aye. Okay, next up, the 19th of September. Can I make a comment on these? I don't have a change. Yes, please. I would just like to give huge, huge kudos to Betsy for these minutes. I mean, to incorporate and capture everything we discussed on each of these applications at the meeting, yeah. I mean, huge thank you to her. I mean, this was so much more than I had expected. So um, I just think she should be recognized for the wonderful work that she does. Indeed, I, I'm still in utter shock that uh, yeah. that she's retiring. Um, Sad. We'll be yeah. very, very missed. Yep. Already. Pardon? Already. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, uh, if there are no uh, proposed changes to minutes of the 19th, is there a motion to accept them as written? Grant, you don't have a, the same change? I think you were vice chair on that one. No, I was co, I'm, I'm, unless, unless she changed them already. Hold on. No, this one is vice. I mean, it's so minor, but. Okay, mine says no, but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so moved. Second. And a second, uh, Doug Mance. I'll abstain, I was absent. Thank you, Grant Farrington. Aye. Ellen Mario. Aye. Lisa Braccio. Aye. Ben Smith is aye. Uh, four sets of minutes. Um, so the ones from uh, uh, the 16th are still outstanding. We've still got plenty of time to attend to those. Um, that brings us up to date, um, and we can get them off the town clerk. Fantastic. I make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Thank you. <laughs> Doug Mance. Aye. Grant Farrington? Aye. Ellen Maria? Aye. Lisa Braccio? Aye. Ben Smith is a yes. All right. Thank you very much, and everybody. Dan, thank you for coming.